Okay. Well, my name is Chris Kindred. This is the Reverend uh, Aaron, Aaron White. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah. I'll go it's ahead and get going. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, what, is, what is Unitarian Universalism? Unitarian Universalism, in a few words, is mm -hmm. a faith that pretty much, if I had to say what we believe and what we're for, we believe that people experience God in uh -huh. many ways. Yeah. We honor that. That all human beings deserve love uh -huh. without exception. Okay. And that religion is about how we act in this life, about okay. building a just and loving world mm -hmm. in this life. And those would be the main you know, things that bring us together. But we okay. are a tradition that came from a merger of the Unitarian Christians and the Universalist Christians uh -huh. in the 1960s. Okay. The Unitarians believed that the thing that was important to focus on was the humanity of the man Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the Universalists believed that no loving God would ever send its creatures and its creation, its children, mm -hmm. to hell. Yeah. And eventually they both became more religiously similar throughout the years. And this oh. is 17, 18, 1900s. Yeah. And then in the 60s, the, the youth of those two churches decided to merge, the teenagers. Yeah. And the okay. adults followed suit uh, 10 they years followed later. followed the kids. Yeah, yeah. So in the 1950s, the youth groups, the denominational youth groups from both of those yeah. churches said, we're really a lot more similar than we are different. Let's join together. And then about yeah. 10 years later, the adults yeah. came in 1960. Well, I hadn't read that. That's fascinating. Yeah. The youth brought it together. Yeah. And uh, the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association of mm -hmm. Congregations, is 50 years old this month. Um, but yeah. Unitarians and Universalists go back hundreds of years oh. um, history in America and Europe, yeah. but we, you know, we have, there, there are evidence of people like Origen oh. um, and other theologians early on in the early church who had both Unitarian and Universalist belief, although okay. they didn't call them that at the time. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, um, so how would you define truth? Well, what is mm -hmm. truth or uh, uh, the meaning, the truth of, of the universe according to UU? Well, that's an interesting thing. That's actually not something that we define for mm. our members. Okay. Uh, we believe that an open, humble quest for truth yeah. is in some senses more important than mm. the answer. Because for us, we understand that I'm a limited, finite human being, mm. and it's really impossible for me, in our understanding, to ever fully know the infinite divine, the infinite right. God, or the infinite universe. Okay. And so for us, I think we actually... It's not that we don't have, we don't come down on any truth lines yet. The sky mm -hmm. is blue. Right, and, right. <laughs> um, but when it comes to claims about ultimacy, yeah. we try to remain humble about that okay. because we don't tend to believe that ultimate truth was revealed in one book or one religious tradition or uh -huh. one teacher. Yeah. Um, I think we tend to believe that each of us is able to grasp a piece of the truth. And okay. so we come together. A big important part okay. of Unitarian Universalism is asking questions, mm -hmm. um, uh, being honest about your doubts, um, and communicating. So yeah. when we, you can't see here in, in the video, but our pulpit in this sanctuary is intentionally lower yeah. than the pews. That's a really interesting aspect. And that's yeah. to symbolize the fact mm -hmm. that neither I or our senior minister, uh, Reverend Canner, believe that we have the version of the truth with a capital T. Okay. That we're just as fallible, uh -huh. finite, um, limited as any other human being. So yeah. for us, the truth is something that we experience in many ways. The mm -hmm. direct experience each of us has of mystery and wonder, the mm -hmm. kind of experience of God that each of us has in mm -hmm. our hearts. Yeah. We learn it through science, through history, through speaking with people of other cultures and faiths. Yeah. But I don't think I would say it's something that I could ever, with integrity, say, I know that the truth of the universe with okay. a capital T is yeah. X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And I think you said something about a, a piece of the truth uh -huh. in that definition. So yeah. um, is the piece of a truth like saying, um, like, is that a subjective or an objective truth? Like, like, would you say that, like, this pin is black, yeah. and I say that uh, the pin is made of plastic? Both are... Uh, a part of an objective truth, uh -huh. and they're both true, but you see one side and I see my side, yeah. or is it like you come to the realization that there's a pen, I come to the realization that there's a camera, uh -huh. and they're mutually independently subjective? Well, you know, that's a really good question, but 
what those terms mean is is difficult, right? So, mm -hmm. and I can't speak, that's the interesting thing. Uh -huh. I can't speak for every Unitarian Universalist yeah. because we promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Uh -huh. So the intention is not for all of us to believe the same thing right. in the pews. In mm -hmm. fact, we like the diversity of belief okay. and reasoning that goes on. Mm -hmm. But I think the majority of us think that objective verifiable truth uh -huh. is an important part of a human life. Okay. So we tend to take very seriously uh, teachings that we get from empirical sciences. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I think the vast majority of our members identify with uh, evidence in an evolutionary worldview perspective, like we would get mm -hmm. from the fossil record, and yeah. things like that. So if we were to say, to look at the evidence, scientific evidence that we could see with our eyes, uh -huh. and someone else said, well, I'm sorry, God told me that's not the, the yeah. case. Mm -hmm. I'm much more likely to believe the evidence I can see and we can all kind of see together. But right, it makes more sense. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. However, I think there's some aspects of our being that you just can't measure in that way. Okay. The kind of stirring of the heart or sometimes you feel a call uh, yeah. from God in a sense into a t particular way of living that I can't measure, I can't show it to you, mm -hmm. I can't do that. Yeah. However, I think that we have to be very careful with that because we see what happens when one person or one group of people thinks God is speaking to them and asking them yeah. to act in a certain way. Uh -huh. So for us, we always say test it out in community. Mm -hmm. Talk to other people. Um, you know, if you think God is calling you to steal, be violent, or take away other people's rights, mm -hmm. um, I would question right. Question that. So, That's what most people Yeah, I think so. Um, so... No, I don't think we believe in the ability for one person to know the capital T truth. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say it's subjective, and it's certainly not moral relativism or okay. anything like that. Um, I tell people that we have a big tent, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of room for a lot of people, but it still has walls. Right. Um, so, for example, we, uh, we were one of the – in fact, the Universalists were the first denomination in the country to ordain a woman officially mm -hmm. in the 1800s. Yeah. And we don't believe that men have any more access to the priestly functions of religion than mm -hmm. women do. So if you believed that men had more access to God than women, you probably would find yourself feeling better in another, <laughs> another religious tradition. Yeah. So I wouldn't tell you that uh, you didn't have room here, but I wouldn't honor that subjective truth. Right like I would others. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, Let me know if I'm not uh, giving you okay, an answer no, that makes uh, Yeah, I will. Sense. Um, okay, you made the, the tent analogy. Yeah. And you said there's walls. So, so what are the walls of the Unitarian Universalist Church? What, what's tolerated and what's not? What can be in the tent? Well, historically, what we've focused on, mm. um, what fits inside the tent, if we're going to use that metaphor, mm. are reason, freedom, and tolerance. Okay. So we believe in much like Baptists, uh -huh. that congregations have the freedom to own their own buildings, call their own right. ministers, they're autonomous, um, that individuals shouldn't be coerced into religious faith. Mm -hmm. They should come to that truth on their own. Right. Freedom, tolerance, that we err on the side of making the tent bigger okay. than smaller. Okay. And reason, that we don't believe that faith is believing things that are unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Faith is putting my trust in a certain way of living. So um, what fits inside the tent for us is an open-minded, humble quest for truth. Mm -hmm. Understanding that God looks and feels different to different people. Mm -hmm. um, and very much so on the inside of the tent is the understanding that our faith is lived through justice work. Justice so, work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So for us... Um, we would, we tend to believe that making the beloved community something real on this earth mm -hmm. is what religion is about. And that saving my soul as an individual person uh -huh. is not the end goal of religion. So okay. on the outside of the tent would be exclusivity. So uh -huh. a community that would uh, not allow gays and lesbians to be full part of their membership. Right. Um, we are fully inclusive of the GLBT community in mm -hmm. our church. Um, 
differences, uh, sexism, racism, forms of oppression, all that's outside the tent. Okay. And fundamentalist claims to truth okay. are outside the tent. That's gotcha. the biggest thing. So uh-huh. um, I have this one understanding of God, and if you don't believe me, you need to either get out of my country yeah. or I'm going to blow you up. Obviously, those yeah. are on the outside. So would you say that those things, uh, the Unitarian Universalist, excuse me, the Unitarian Universalist the Church does not tolerate uh, things like fundamentalism or orthodox religions? Uh, I don't know if we'd say orthodox religions uh-huh. um, because we believe there's a place for, we wouldn't exclude them from our society. Okay. Would you um, let them be a member of your church? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Membership in our church isn't uh, about what you believe. Okay. It's about a promise of how you're going to act in the world. So we're not a creedal religion, even much like the Baptist, actually. Mm-hmm. But like in the Catholic church where to be a member, you have to say, I believe these things. Okay. For us, how you live is way more important than what you say you believe. Okay. In fact, uh, this sounds a little bit glib to say it like this, but I really don't care what you believe. Uh-huh. I care how you act. Okay. So uh, if you believe that there are three gods or one or none, mm-hmm. but you live as a just, loving person uh-huh. who is generous, cares for the poor and the least of these, okay. and opens your heart to loving as many human beings as possible, okay. how many or how few gods you mm-hmm. believe in is way down on my list of things that are important. Right. Um, but your question was about would we exclude those people? Anyone is welcome to become a member. Uh-huh. Um, but certain behaviors wouldn't be tolerated. Okay. So certain behaviors um, that wouldn't be tolerated in most churches, right? right. We're actually a lot more similar than I think people mm-hmm. would believe. But um, violent behavior, racist behavior, um, any form of uh, sexist behavior, uh-huh. homophobic behavior. Um, like I said, we err on the side of inclusivity right. and the understanding that we're in a humble search for truth. A lot of times, people who choose to be in the church or out, that's a self-selective thing. So mm-hmm. if you believe that the primary and only form of religious truth came through Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 uh-huh. years ago, you're probably going to be more comfortable in another church. Uh-huh. We're not going to ask you to leave. Yeah. You can believe that and be a member of our church, and some do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but we, my guess is that you'd be more comfortable in a church that uh-huh. believes that. Okay. If you believe that there are many ways to experience truth and that we should find religious meaning in poetry and in the stories from our Christian heritage and from stories of Buddhism and Hinduism mm-hmm. and Islam and that yeah. they all have something to offer us, mm-hmm. then you're probably going to be more comfortable here. Um, often, we're not the ones telling you, you can't belong here. Mm-hmm. Um, when a person chooses to stay or go, it's, it's their choice. Their choice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, uh, what would you? How would you define salvation? The the concept of salvation. That's a very prevalent term yeah. in uh, a lot of different religions. So does it have any place in the UU Church? It does, but it probably means something different than uh, what it might mean in your church yeah. or any other churches. When I, um, like I told you, I grew up uh, in a Baptist home, and then I was baptized as a teenager in the Baptist church. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I remembered salvation for me meant Um, my individual soul through the death and resurrection of Jesus Mm -hmm. being saved from the possibility of hell and being moved into the reality of heaven. Um, For us, those ways of thinking don't tend to resonate with a lot of our members. Um, Because we don't believe in a hell or make claims about the afterlife, Mm -hmm. salvation means something different. So... um, we actually don't tend to talk about an afterlife a lot in our church. Okay. Um, the reason being, I've never been dead, uh-huh. and I can't stand up here honestly and tell the church that I know what happens right. after you die. Now, now you said that uh, when you were in a Baptist church, that was your definition of salvation. That was how I understood it okay. as a person. I don't know if other people in the church understood right. it. Mm-hmm. So now how do you understand salvation? Salvation for me yeah. means growing in wholeness, love, and justice over the course of my life. Okay. So... Heaven and hell, I think, in the way I understand them, I've experienced hell during this life and, mm-hmm. and little pieces of heaven during this life. Yeah. And um, it's not about... Salvation is about building and becoming a part of a beloved, just, and loving community. Okay. 
So it's not a one-time thing uh, for me. It's not a one-time decision, nor does it have anything to do with what happens after I die. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about being saved from hell because I don't understand a God that would send its creation mm -hmm. to hell. Right. Finite, imperfect humans for being imperfect. Mm -hmm. But I do know that I, people need to be saved from addiction and loneliness, okay. saved from consumerism and militarism right. and nationalism and racism. There's a lot to be saved from. Okay. And so, yes, I think that we do talk about people being saved, but... Not in that sense. Not the way it used right. to understand that term. Okay. So um, salvation is about, I think, um, growing my soul. Okay. Becoming soul. more fully human. And every week we say our affirmation here. Okay. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace. To seek knowledge and freedom. To serve humanity and fellowship to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. Okay. Thus do we covenant with each other. Oh, we say that every weird. week that we worship. Yeah, well, yeah. you use... <laughs> one thing we can do is talk you to death. Yeah. Um, but for me, I think salvation is growing in harmony with God. Mm -hmm. um, it's a life that's more full and loving and just. It's a life where I grow in humility and courage. Um, it's not, in my understanding, a, a one-moment thing. And okay. Because I don't know what happens after you die, I'm, yeah. I'm more concerned with, with right now. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, so f salvation in the sense of being saved, from what it sounds like you're saying, mm -hmm. is not being saved from hell or no. uh, eternal sin, but being saved from uh, injustices of the world. Or You mentioned like racism and sexism. And yeah. So um, salvation is being saved from those things. I guess, but that sounds, I think, I might want to question the whole premise. Uh, uh, my premise is salvation, meaning being saved from something. Yeah, exactly. So what, what, is, what are you being saved from, according to your yeah. version of the truth? Yeah, well, that sounds kind of like a, a negative way to put it. Uh -huh. um, I guess the positive way to put it was that uh -huh. we experience salvation when we grow okay. in loving and just community with one another. So salvation is growth. I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think so. And then again, I mean, all of these one-shot religious terms that we use, mm -hmm. heaven, hell, God, salvation, prayer, mm -hmm. I think it's hard to sum any of those big concepts up into right. you know, one sentence. So, okay. Yeah. Um, like I said, any time from the 1700s on, our universalist ancestors were questioning the idea that a loving creator God... Mm -hmm. Uh, would eternally punish a human being and so without that threat talking about being saved from something like yeah. that maybe even the language isn't right for right. us anymore but I wouldn't I wouldn't throw out that term I think okay I think I've seen people that needed to be saved from lives of consumerism and hopelessness mm. and yeah. addiction and all sorts of things so yeah. I think there is a role for the our church to talk about mm. saving people from those realities, but I, I don't think we, we probably mean it in the same sense. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, but, but your definition and your explanation does follow a, uh, an understandable line of thought. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. Now, uh, we talked about John uh, Burens, is that how you pronounce his uh -huh. last name? Yeah. He said in his book that uh, standard Christian theology divides the saved from the damned, mm -hmm. but universalism is the teaching that ultimately God will save all souls. Uh, so universal salvation. Would yeah. you agree with that? Will everyone be saved? Absolutely. But uh -huh. what? And I mean that without question. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I mean it in the same way that Rob Bell <laughs> might mean it. Yeah. Um, because I don't believe there's a hell to be saved from. Okay. So what I mean and what John probably means in mm -hmm. that universalist sense for us is that we all came from the same source. Mm -hmm. And we all share the same destiny. Okay. All of us, again, are reunited with the holy. Okay. In some sense, after we die. Uh -huh. And whatever that means. So like I said, I've never been dead before. So I right. can't tell uh -huh. you. I have not seen it with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, absolutely. I think okay. that all of creation, and I don't just mean human beings. I think uh -huh. all of creation and the vastness of the universe is reunited with uh -huh. God. So I'm, uh, I think I'm talking about something that's 
bigger uh, than just human beings, if that makes right, sense. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's uh, it really broadens the, the concept of salvation uh, from what you're telling me. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that kind of clears up what, what John said uh -huh. uh, in his book. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, what about the issue of uh, sin, of evil? Uh -huh. um, how, how do you uh, address that? So I think sin and evil are probably two different things okay. for me. And again, I can't speak for every Unitarian Universalist, but yeah. as one of the leaders of this community, when I say the word sin, I mean missing the mark. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't mean original sin yeah. in the way that Augustine talked about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that I was born with tendencies and desires yeah. and frailties that I didn't ask to be born with. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask to have sexual desires for somebody other than my partner. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask to uh, be attracted to foods with sugar, fat, and salt in them. Right. I was just mm -hmm. born that way. So yeah. when I say that word, I mean that I inherited through the simple fact of being born a human being mm -hmm. all of these frailties and limitations and imperfections. Mm -hmm. And there's the person I want to be, the life I want to live, and the life I think God calls me to. And then there's that big gap, and then there's the right. person I am, and the life I lead, and okay. the the life that I'm you know I'm actually living. And I think sometimes that gap is maybe how I define sin, or mm -hmm. those moments when I don't hit the mark, when I know yeah. I need to. Now, evil for me is a stronger word than that. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I understand evil to be a real thing. And I understand it to be the active and destructive forces which would deny life, justice, and liberty. Okay. Um, so organized, destructive powers that deny the creative, okay. divine life that okay. moves in the world. But it, it sounds like you're saying that uh, sin could be uh, reduced to a person... You know, like like you said, a, a desire yeah. to eat bad food or whatever. Yeah. Um, but evil is, is bigger, and it, it it's maybe a group of people, or maybe a concept or an idea, or anything that could be destructive to to man's. Yeah, I think it's a uh, it's a issue of degree for me. I think there's mm -hmm. structural sin. Yeah. So I would look at how um, certain policies that we have as a country mm -hmm. that we all participate in in the system yeah. deny equal rights and access to goods and services to poor communities. Okay. That to me feels like a structural sin. We're not yeah. living the life we can live. Okay. A structural evil, I would believe, is that intentional degradation of life. Yeah. Uh, like Jim Crow racism in the United States. Right. Like a destructive militarism that would worship a flag over God. Mm. Um, the kind of genocide, or even the ignorance of genocide yeah. when we would turn our backs okay. and not assist those who uh -huh. does that make that degree the difference between oh we should really make a policy change here and we're all responsible mm -hmm. to the kind of destructive powerful forces that would take away a, a person's humanity or destroy God's creation yeah. with that that force and that mm -hmm. energy much bigger scale yeah um, that's not to say I don't believe that all of us are capable of a kind of evil mm -hmm. um, but I'm really hesitant to start identifying a person. Right. as evil. I, I, I don't think I would call one person an evil person. Mm -hmm. That doesn't feel right to yeah. me. What would you call someone like Adolf Hitler or Timothy McVeigh evil? Um, you know, I think I would say that they were swayed by and participated in evil. Uh -huh. um, but I don't know. I worry about it, not because I'm, I worry what they, what they think. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I believe that all human beings in some form deserve love, that no one is beyond redemption. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I think I carried from my Baptist heritage, mm -hmm. actually. Is that okay. No human being is ever uh, beyond redemption. But I worry when we start, I think when we start learning to label a human being as evil, we start feeling more comfortable labeling a group of people as evil. Right. And then I'm very worried because I see what all sorts of people in the world, us included, have done when we start calling one group of people yeah. evil. I mean, it, things things get out of hand right. and, and violent. So, um, yeah, I think those people participated in great forms of evil, um, mm -hmm. but I don't even like to engage in that practice of calling one person evil because I'm worried about the, mm -hmm. the path that we can get right. when we start doing yeah, what it can lead to. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, how do you think, does God deal with sin and evil? Do you think that concerns him? 
Uh, well, so the way that we think about God may be different. Um, okay. Well, tell me how you think about God then. Um, Let's start there. Yeah, God, I understand, is the ground of all being, the source okay. from which we all emanated, the love okay. that has produced the stars, the oceans, right. and, and you and I. I don't imagine God to be a man or a woman, mm-hmm. but something beyond that. I mean, I imagine that's a very human way for me to imagine mm-hmm. God that looks a lot like me. Right. Um, and I worry when my God looks too much like I want it to look. Mm. Um, so for me, God is, is bigger than just a man or a woman. But uh, your question was about how does God deal with it? Yeah. I don't tend to think that God intervenes in that way. Okay. Um, I think we are the hands and feet and body. I think there's as much of God in me and you mm. as there is in any other yeah. human being. So for me, it's... Um, for me, it's up to us okay. to deal with those things. Okay. Up to us to live with it, um, if that makes sense. I think so, yeah. yeah. It's a little wordy, but I, I think I get what you're, what you're <laughs> yeah, right. I think I, it's um, understandable. Yeah, I don't think a hand reaches down from the mm-hmm. sky and alters history right. like that. I think the way God deals with sin is that I have this glimpse in me, yeah. this spark of the divine that says, no, there's still a better way of living. Uh-huh. And I act on it. Okay. I move on it. And I join with others in moving on it. And that feels like a subtle way for God to do mm-hmm. it. But I, I certainly don't think that God causes floods. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think, you know, I hear people like Jerry Falwell argue that 9 11 was caused because of feminists and lesbians and liberals. And, or that, uh, I, you know, I heard people talking about storms and mm. natural phenomena as yeah. punishment from God to deal with sin and that makes no sense to me. I just can't okay. I can't wrap my mind around a God that would right. kill somebody in a storm. Okay. Um, how, how do you use address the Christian concept of there needing to be a, a, a sacrificial atonement, a substitutionary atonement yeah. uh, from Jesus Christ the Savior mm-hmm. from sin and you know the Christian concept that there is sin, and God uh, will not tolerate it. Yeah. And His Son Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, and He died as a substitute. And whoever has faith in Him will be uh, forgiven of sin. It's yeah. a very, very definite. Uh, Absolutely. So, what, what, what's a use response to that concept? Uh, I don't think it tends to make sense for a lot of us mm-hmm. that um, someone else's death or the death of someone's child would make up for. Mm-hmm. For my imperfection, yeah, and in fact, we don't see human sin as something that's that needs to be punished by a thing like hell. So, okay. you know, the fact that we don't we don't believe there's a hell, mm-hmm. we don't think that someone needed to mm-hmm. to save us from that. Okay, um, uh, I in no way mean to be dismissive of that notion of understanding. Okay, but for me, it's very hard to imagine. A kind of loving parent yeah. that would require that form of sacrifice okay. um, for creatures that were created the way they were created. Uh-huh. Um, so it, it, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to us for someone right. else to pay the price. Uh, I pay the price for my mistakes in the pain of uh, isolation or mm. um, addiction. Or yeah. um, I think we. We experience the results of our mm-hmm. our sin ourselves, mm-hmm. and I don't think that someone else dying would take away the reality of that yeah. uh, for me, or that it would result in hell. So, you know, it's kind of like we're talking in a little different language there. Mm-hmm. That notion of atonement yeah. wouldn't really make sense in that system. Okay. Yeah. And how would you use respond to uh, the man of Jesus Christ? Yeah. So we have for many centuries seen. Jesus as one of the primary moral teachers in the history of the world. Mm-hmm. So we, uh, our Unitarian Christian ancestors held him up as the primary moral teacher, yeah. the premier understanding of the life of ethics and loving God. Mm-hmm. And our Universalist ancestors early on believed in the atonement mm-hmm. through the death of Jesus. Yeah. Um, now I think most of us tend to understand him as our historical ancestor in our religion, because mm-hmm. we yeah. came out of the Christian religions. Um, 
I see him as a really phenomenal moral teacher mm -hmm. who had an understanding of the amount of God that was in him yeah. and in others, uh, more so than almost anybody else in history. Yeah. So we actually talk a lot in our church about following the religion of Jesus uh -huh. and not about Jesus. Okay. I know other people say that, but so for us, the intention is to live the way that Jesus talked about living, okay. not to worship one person. Okay. But the intention is to live, uh, you know, what did Jesus say? The two commandments are to love God uh -huh. with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, yeah. and to love your neighbors yourself. And if I could do that, <laughs> that would be... That would be an amazing feat if I yeah. could actually live like that all the time. So yeah, certainly for us, we take the, the moral and the ethical teachings of Jesus very seriously. Uh -huh. um, but see, seeing him as um, like the Council of Nicaea would see him as half God, half man uh -huh. is not as important. Okay. Uh, well, how can you take uh, the moral teachings of Jesus and apply it to your life, but totally dismiss the, the very cornerstone of what he taught, which was salvation by faith in him as the one and only Son of God. Well, I think uh, if we looked at the scriptures, we'd probably find different evidences of that. I mean, I know that I can pick out particularly in the book of John or, mm -hmm. uh, or specific books in the Bible where the teaching did seem to be focused on Jesus understanding himself as the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. Um, but I look at a lot of other teachings, oh. particularly in books like Mark or Luke, oh. where Jesus seemed a lot more concerned with how people treated the poor okay. and the least of these than he did people following him. Oh. Uh, so, so what's the criteria of deciding what to uh, take away from Jesus and what to keep? You know, I think... That's a difficult question because there's a lot that I think we want to get rid of from religious teachings because mm. it's hard for us to hear yeah, and it's challenging. Very hard. Um, but anything that doesn't feel like it's rooted in an ethic of love and mm. justice. I know I keep coming back to that right. phrase. We tend to fall toward those teachings that move us in that direction. Okay. And that's why we find ourselves also listening to the insights of other world religions and poetry mm -hmm. yeah. and philosophy and history because I think there are a lot of teachers who can lead us in that direction. Mm -hmm. Well, if it would seem to me that if, if a man uh, like Jesus uh, taught good moral ethics and yet uh, he also taught, you know, like I said, you know, salvation by having faith in him, uh, if if, if the cornerstone of what he taught, you know, salvation by faith in him, is wrong, then why wouldn't you dismiss everything he said? Because he kind of comes across as a, as a crazy lunatic. No, if he, no, if he I teaches don't good things, yeah. but he's wrong about the core message that he came to teach. It's evidenced uh, in the Gospels and the Bible and historically by other accounts of eyewitnesses and historians who, who saw him. How could you take any credit at all on a man who he came... Uh, preaching a message of salvation through faith in him, uh, but also taught moral ethics. But, you know, again, you dismiss the, the cornerstone of what he taught, but, but keep some of it. I mean, wouldn't he kind of come across as a crazy guy if, if he was saying something as profound as, I am uh, the son of the Father, I am sure. God? Uh, how, could, how could you believe a guy like that if, if you think that he's wrong in saying that? Well, I, mean, I, I don't know if I would say Jesus is wrong. Um, we understand the Bible to be mm -hmm. books written by human beings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know the, from biblical studies that yeah. uh, we can date the history of books right. and why they were written and who wrote them in the communities. And so I have to say I believe that there's a difference between what Jesus said and what people wrote about what he said. Okay. If that makes sense. So, so, so maybe the Bible isn't, isn't accurate. No, I wouldn't say that it isn't accurate because that feels like an attack on the Bible. Well, no, if, if, I don't think it has to be taken literally all okay. the time. When Jesus says, I'm the doorway to such and such, I don't uh -huh. think he meant he was a doorway. Uh -huh. um, you know, we know that Jesus taught in parables okay. and didn't, I don't think the message of the good Samaritan yeah. was to know how good that one Samaritan was. It was okay. meant to teach other things. So we just don't take the Bible to be literal. Okay. In this sense, we teach it 
we teach it as a text written by human beings that teaches uh -huh. um, a moral and humble way of approaching God in the mm -hmm. world. So I look at the life of the man Jesus and I see this radical sacrifice. Here's a person who was willing uh -huh. to die preaching that an ethic of love was more important than the power of empire. Uh -huh. That devotion should be given to God and love and not Caesar. Okay. Yeah. And he was so committed to that message that he's willing to die for it and be humiliated in it. That is the ultimate lesson mm -hmm. in someone who's willing to sacrifice their, their very life mm -hmm. for their love of God and others. That's worth following for me, even if I don't literally believe mm -hmm. um, a, a certain passage mm -hmm. in which Jesus makes that claim. Yeah. I don't think that anyone else is necessarily going to be harmed by believing that. I think mm -hmm. there's, uh, God, there's so many people who have done fabulous work in the world who did believe that very literally and there mm -hmm. are people doing wonderful work who do. But I don't think I have to uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't mean to be flippant in, in that, but I think that just because I don't believe that one part of the story doesn't mean that that man, Jesus, and the ethic of love and loving God that he spoke of isn't something that's profoundly important for my life. So you, you hold on to and you believe in uh, the, the lessons and the moral ethics that can be taken from the story of Jesus, yeah. but, you, uh, but you don't believe that uh, in, you don't believe in passages that were record, were recorded where he said that I'm the way through the life, no one gets to the Father except through, through me, and that he is the way to salvation. No, personally, I don't think that okay. the man Jesus is the only route to, okay. uh, to union with God. No. Uh, I, I asked this earlier, and uh, uh, maybe I just didn't understand it. So by, by what criteria do you, do you decide um, to, to, to weigh, okay, what, what am I going to take from Jesus, what am I not? You know, you've decided that I'm going to take away that he is the only way to salvation, but I'm yeah. going to keep some of the ethics that he taught. And again, I know I asked this before, but yeah. try to clarify it for me. What, what's the filter? What's the... <sighs> what's the weight, the, the measurement they use to take away some and keep others? I think, I mean, I think all people do that, first mm -hmm. of all. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the book of Acts, all of the apostles were told that they couldn't belong to the church unless they sold everything they owned mm -hmm. and distributed their goods and money equally. Yeah. Um, Jesus told the rich man in the parable that the only thing he needed to do was sell all his possessions in order to get to heaven and mm -hmm. give all his money to the poor. Yeah. Well, I know millions of uh, Bible-believing Christians mm. who seem to have forgotten that part of the literal message and have made a yeah. choice about which parts of the gospel they're going to follow, uh -huh. too. Um, so I think we all, whether we say we do or not, uh -huh. pick and choose which parts we're going to do. Uh -huh. How many of us judge others? How yeah. many of us haven't sold all our possessions and given them to the poor? Mm. In fact, uh, those teachings, I think Jesus might have been pretty literal <laughs> in what he has to do. Yeah. I sure haven't done it. Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of what I choose to believe... I have to weigh against the experience of my life. Mm -hmm. So I have such generous, kind, loving Muslim friends and Hindu friends. Yeah. And I look at a text that says the most important thing we can do is love God and love others. Mm -hmm. And my experience of finding those people in my life, that seems like a teaching that meets my experience of the world. Okay. But if I... I read something in scripture or I hear something from a TV preacher or, or something that talks about people who don't follow Jesus being punished eternally. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't match up with my yeah. experience of the world. So I think often I have to, I think maybe that's the answer. I just mm -hmm. have to gauge what I hear and read with a discerning mind that says, this doesn't make sense to me based on what I've experienced. So you, some does. So your own experience, your own feelings, your own heart is the basis by which you, uh, define your truth? Uh, I think ultimately so. Sometimes I can be wrong. And mm -hmm. I have to be in community with people who are going to yeah. call me out on the times mm -hmm. when I'm wrong. But yeah, I think ultimately every person has to make a decision in their heart okay. what part of their tradition they're going to yeah. carry and which part they're going to leave aside. And, that, and like I said, I think all people do it. Um, yeah, they do. You know, we... Uh, I know a lot of 
a lot of people from Christian, Jewish, uh, Muslim traditions mm -hmm. who say, well, you know, this was written at a time when X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. and so now that we're in this time, I understand these texts differently. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, Muslim friends. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the, what, what do you think about the Muhammad who, of, of the Quran, who, who wrote the Quran? Uh, my guess, uh, because I don't know him, yeah. uh, was that he was a man who found a certain aspect of okay. his experience of God that led him to, to write these texts. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, I think like any other human being, he got a piece of his understanding of God and wrote yeah. it down. Many people take it as literal truth, I don't. Yeah. Um, but I think he, he's probably one of many mm -hmm. seekers who, yeah. who wrote down his texts. Uh, so the text that he did write, yep. he wrote uh, Five Pillars of Islam. And I'm sure you're familiar with yep. it. He wrote that uh, there's only one way of salvation, and that is to uh, profess that there's only one God, and right. Muhammad is the final prophet, uh, to give to the poor, to pray several times a day, to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, and to fast during the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. That, like Jesus saying that his core message was faith in him alone, and that's the way to salvation, Muhammad said that this was the only way to salvation, the five right. pillars. So you have uh, Muhammad and Jesus, and both say, this is the one exclusive way to God. Sure. The other one is the one exclusive way to God. Right. So, uh, you know, how, how can you take... Well, first of all, let me go back. I mean, do you take principles from, from Islam and Christianity? Oh, absolutely. Okay. It doesn't mean I accept everything. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I see Yahweh, the God Yahweh, asking yeah. uh, the early Israelites to kill every last man, woman, and child of the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. And I certainly hope that we wouldn't take that as something we would try and do. So yeah. I see those parts in the Quran mm -hmm. that talk about that kind of aggression mm -hmm. or right. other things. And I think they're a product of their time mm -hmm. when those texts were written in tribal yeah. societies um, that lived in very violent ways. Yeah. So um, I think any exclusive claim like that that says this is the mm -hmm. only way um, doesn't really yeah. make a lot of sense to me. So it sounds so like... So sure, if charity... Mm -hmm. The, the parts of Islam and mm -hmm. the Quran that I know that talk about the need to take care of the poor, mm -hmm. the least of these widows, yeah. uh, sure, I can get behind that. Yeah. Um, but the idea that there's only one person who's ever fully mm -hmm. experienced God, no, not for me. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, what you're saying, uh, for, for Aaron White personally, yeah. is that you, you, you can recognize good teachings and good ethics from people like Muhammad, sure. people like Jesus, but you you see them as just that, good things to do. And you judge that, like you said, from your heart, from personal experiences, <laughs> but uh, that's as far as it goes. Jesus was not uh, who he said he was, which was you know the son of God, the way to salvation. Muhammad was not who he said he was, the final prophet, and his way is the only way to God. It sounds to me like you, you can recognize the good things that they said, and that's what you take from it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the stuff that tends to challenge me to live a just and loving life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I would put it as, I wouldn't say Jesus was who he said he was. Um, mm -hmm. I think people later wrote down about their experiences with Jesus. Okay. So I don't believe... Uh, mm -hmm that it's literally true that the person who wrote that down yeah. said it, but um, no, I, think that there's, I think there's vast amounts of good to be found in mm -hmm. many world religions. There's also really dangerous parts of mm -hmm. almost every religion I've seen yeah. uh, has done really terrible things. Yeah. And so I think we just have to be really discerning mm -hmm. and use our minds and think critically for ourselves and not take it on truth just because somebody else says it. Mm -hmm. And the, the way to, to decide what, what our truth is and to live a good life is not by um, God, but by realizing for ourselves what our own subjective truth is. Like you said, like uh, going off of experiences about what feels right. Uh, uh, that's what creates each person's subjective truth. Well, I don't not, know how I would put it in terms of okay. not God, but my subjective truth. Uh -huh. I think God is moving in you okay. and me right now. So it doesn't even make sense for me to separate God from, yeah. from this moment and from us. So it's not about, no, I think God's very much a part of it. Okay. That movement of your heart that says, it's time for me to get back in right relationship with my sister. Mm -hmm. That 
calling that it's time for me to choose a different way of living. I think God's active in that, uh-huh. very active in that. So I, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't set it apart in the language okay. you used about not God, but my subjective experience. And the way I decide is also testing, looking around in the world, asking mm-hmm. other people. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't mean proof like you can always see under a microscope. But, yeah. Um, the kind that says, hey, I think I'm called to live this kind of life. Mm-hmm. Does this make sense? And being in communication with others, I think, is really important. I don't think any of us lives in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And I've, and I've seen people, as you well know, uh, you take a Bible and 20 people read it, and you come away with many different understandings. So it's, yeah, definitely. You know, it's, it's hard to even understand what it would mean to, mm-hmm. to literally live by a text or a tradition. Right. I think earlier you said something about you don't want to uh, separate God from different things, mm-hmm. something like that. So do you think that uh, there is one God who is just as much a part of uh, Buddhist teaching in his way, just as much a part of uh, Muhammad's way, just as much a part of Jesus' way, Moses, um, mm-hmm. you, what, what you decide to, to preach, and it's, it's the same God, the same source, or is God changing? Is he different? Is he different for each person? I, mean, um, I think that God is something for me and a presence that is, God's self is infused throughout all creation. I think mm-hmm. of it like um, light coming in through a window. Yeah. Uh, and I think Forest Church uses this metaphor. Yeah, in his in, book. That in I his read, book. So, talks about you know, chapel with I think sometimes Buddhists are in, we're all on a big chapel, and the Christians are looking through one window, and the light shines in, and it looks a certain way. Mm-hmm. And the Buddhists look in through another window, yeah. and the light shining. And I think God is the light in that metaphor. Okay. And, and us as finite, limited human beings who are not God, mm-hmm. in on all of ourselves, yeah. experience that mm-hmm. in, in different ways. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't think that means that they're all equally valid so I don't think that anyone who gets up and says hey I've had this experience of God and God told me uh, you're supposed to give me all my money and oh. you know I mean right. I think that uh, we see people claim to speak for God all the time and it mm-hmm. gets uh, it's a dangerous thing to do um, okay I, we see that it doesn't always turn out in a way that promotes life love and, and justice um, okay so yes I think the presence of God is in all religious teachings. I don't think that means that we should weigh them all the same, but we should approach them with a discerning mind and say, what do I really think about this? Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't think that we should dismiss one as not having God in it and one as another. I think God is too big for me to ever be confined to one human experience. Now, uh, I I think you just said that God is, is in each religion. Sure. Okay. Yeah. But each religion is very contradictory. I mean, you have uh, religions that speak of several gods. You have uh, religions that speak of one god, like Islam and uh, Christianity and Judaism. So if God is prevalent in all of those, then God himself seems like a very contradictory being. I think God's complex. Okay. I think those religions are only um, contradicting one another if we take them literally. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk to many Hindus who yeah. understand that the language they use for God with Krishna or Shiva are just words okay. that signify something so much bigger. I mean, I don't think God is God's name, right? We have limited okay. human language and understanding. Mm-hmm. and The reality of God's bigger than anything I can ever fully get my head around. Um, so, I, yes, I think that some religious traditions do make different claims about the truth. Mm-hmm. We can't argue about that. But I don't think that they... I don't want to pit them against one another. It sounds mm-hmm. like... That question kind of makes it sound like, oh, I have to pick one is right and yeah. one is wrong. And I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I think okay. everybody's got something to offer. Like, for example, my mom. Mm-hmm. To me, she's mom. Right. And to her brother, she's sister. Mm-hmm. She's that one person. Yeah. But when I talk about her, I'm going to talk about my mother. Mm-hmm. And when my uncle talks about her, he's going to describe his sister. Yeah. But you could say, but you said, God, your mom's a mother, Mm -hmm. and he says your mom's a sister, Mm -hmm. and those are contradictory. And I think only if you mean that that's the only thing they can be. Mm -hmm. I think God has looked like that man, Jesus, in Nazareth dying on a cross. Mm -hmm. I think God has been present in the poor of Calcutta being served by Mother Teresa. I think think God is present in you and I right now. Okay. So um, 
I think we get into trouble when we pit the religions against each other in that way. If that okay. makes sense. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Uh, I want to briefly go back to uh, the man of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, how, what do you think about uh, his death, burial, and resurrection? Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? No. The literal resurrection, no. Okay. Now, there's a lot of uh, historical evidence outside of the Bible written by um, secular eyewitnesses that give great evidence to the fact that he did, did in fact, raise from the dead. I mean, how do you re reconcile yourself with those facts? Well, you'd have to put them in front of me. Okay. Yeah, uh, I have some. I don't know. Um, but... You know, I understand that that is a series of texts and experiences written many thousands of years uh -huh. ago. And like I said, just because someone wrote it down uh -huh. for me doesn't mean that I believe it. Right. Um, there are many, in fact, there's dozens of stories of individuals who, um, let's say, were purported to be born of a virgin at that time. Mm -hmm. I could call that evidence that there were 25 yeah. other people that were born of a virgin. Mm -hmm. um, right. For me, that's not the important part. And I think that's the difference here. Okay. I'm not trying to be saved from hell because I right. don't believe that a loving God would create a hell. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it actually does not matter whether or not Jesus was resurrected. Okay. It's that sacrificial life of love okay. and justice, of calling people to love God more than they love money and mm -hmm. power. That's the important thing, and that's what I follow. So, whether the Rex, I mean, if, if I had a videotape of the resurrection, mm -hmm. I guess I'd probably have to cons consider that right. pretty seriously, yeah. right? Who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. um, but because we have someone wrote it down 2,000 mm -hmm. years ago, yeah. and there's a lot of things that were written down, so it's hard for me to say that I believe one and not the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I want to backtrack on, on your answer that you said just now. You yeah. said that you don't believe that uh, a loving God could send anyone to hell. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your basis for believing that? You know, um, I think I grew up and a lot of people described God to me as a loving parent. Mm -hmm. And I imagined that I could never send my child to hell. Right. No matter what they've done. Mm -hmm. No matter if they killed no matter if they stole, no matter if they denied me with every fiber of their being, I could never send a child mm -hmm. to be punished yeah. forever. Right. And if I'm just a human, messed up and frail as I am, mm -hmm. and God is God, the vast, infinite source of all that has ever been, the most loving presence that will ever be in the universe, mm -hmm. if I can't do it, I don't know how God could. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense for me for the infinite God to infinitely punish mm -hmm. a finite human right. for making finite mistakes. Well, you said that if you couldn't do it, you don't understand how God could do it. Yeah. But wouldn't you say that God is, I mean, you said uh, this afternoon that God is bigger than you, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what do you think about the, the, the Christian notion that uh, God is holy, he's perfect, he's righteous, without blemish? Would you agree with that? Without blemish, sure, um, okay. but I don't. I don't think we. I don't think we even understand that uh, God to be the same thing. I don't imagine God as kind of a person okay. who's talking to me in English. <laughs>